Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm happy you are able to join me today. My name is Mariah. Um, I'm one of the technical account managers here at Sinobiological, and I am a PhD scientist by training um, with a PhD from Syracuse University in recombinant expression. Um, and I'm glad that you had enough interest in our cell free system to join us today. Um, so with that, I would like to get started on our high throughput cell free expression system. This allowing rapid screening of small antibody fragments like nanobodies and SCFVs. So this seems pretty obvious to people who work in um, this type of field, but if you're new to this kind of field, why would we need this high throughput nanobody screening? Um, there's several different reasons, um, one of which is if you do some form of AI modeling where you've, you have your drug target and you're looking for a way to screen a bunch of different sequences all at once. A lot of people do this through an, um, AI modeling. And we're able to take that computational modeling, AI modeling, and take it into lab and bio-validate it. So a lot of times through these types of techniques, we'll have a huge library of different sequences that people would like to screen for binding affinity, just standard expression, um, if they are able to express or not, and or um, this could come out of something like an antibody development project where, uh, where in that case you have done something like phage display or biopanning and you have maybe 30 to 100 different sequences with varying degrees of affinity towards your target and you'd like to screen them to see their uh, producibility in different systems and binding affinity. So this um, platform is very much for a high throughput type screening um, to rapidly test a bunch of different sequences all at once. Um, this can also be used for um, small proteins. In that case, you would probably have something like a large mutation library. Um, maybe you're testing different disease states with different mutations, or you're optimizing your binding affinity by making point mutations. Um, so these are just some of the reasons why you would look for this type of platform and a high throughput platform in general. Um, yeah. So starting all the way at the beginning, what is cell-free expression? So protein, um, starting with how proteins are translated to begin with, it all comes back to that general biology, central dogma, um, protein transcription from DNA to mRNA, mRNA to protein. Um, this is how all proteins are made um, via um, recombinant expression, transient expression. Um, we use cells to perform this process. In a cell-free system, we eliminate the any extra or additional things in the cell that are not required for protein expression. Your cells in general do a lot of things. Um, they're not solely doing protein production. And we've, you know, let, uh, borrowed this kind of technology from cells in general over the years, coming up with transient expression and things like that, where if we can remove some of those other processes, the extra DNA, um, other things from the cell to optimize solely protein expression, that's what the idea behind cell-free really is. So instead of doing a cell-based production, we eliminate anything that's not required for recombinant expression, and we focus solely on components of a reaction, right? Um, you, if you think about it and you break down those arrows in that first figure on the top left, it's really just an enzymatic reaction with polymerases. So in this case, we're doing a one-pot reaction, right, with your amino acids, your DNA, your enzyme machinery um, from cell lysates, 
and you add energy in the form of a, uh, ATP. So this all goes into one test tube reaction. Um, it does transcription and translation. And then we purify out um, the small VHH or SCFV antibody fragments. And this is typically done with um, an IMAC purification technique. Um, the other advantage to this, so it is faster than traditional um, bacterial expression. So for traditional bacterial expression, you purify your DNA, you transform it into E. coli, you grow the colonies under selection, you grow the cells up, and then you harvest the cultures, creating cell pellet, etc., cetera, um, leading to a recombinant protein. This takes about one to two days, which is pretty fast if you compare it to other techniques. Now, if we do a cell-free expression, this can take just a matter of hours. And the way this works is we grow cells um, without the antibody selection or under antibiotic selection, but not a specific protein of interest. We don't have a vector in there. So we're growing up the cells, purifying them and holding the lysates only the lysates are then transferred into your Eppendorf tube or your test tube to then perform the reaction. And you add the DNA at that step. And that saves a considerable amount of time because you are not waiting for the cells to grow up. In this case, the cells have already grown up and you can spread out the cells among different, um, different expression systems, allowing for you to purify proteins within a couple of hours. Um, so our cell-free expression system really optimizes and speeds up the timeline um, in a traditional expression. Um, so a little bit about our platform. So we, our cell-free platform has been optimized for small antibody fragments and small peptides. So we have had very large successes with um, VHHs uh, with a his tag and SCFVs with a his tag. So these, um, our system is very good at disulfide bond formation and um, allows for this high throughput screen, the his tag allows for the high throughput purification um, that really gets those timelines down, um, which you can see on the right hand side of this slide. Um, we can do um, VHH his in one to two weeks um, with an SCFV HIS in two to three weeks. So this includes gene synthesis all the way to purification. Um, so it really has optimized the timeline for how fast we can express these constructs. Um, in addition, we have done this with some small peptides with either a HIS tag or a SUMO HIS tag, um, and it has worked successfully. And this, the small peptides really fit this little niche in between something like a solid state synthesis where you're expressing like 30 amino acid um, peptides between that and recombinant expression where you're looking to express something in, you know, maybe five kilodalton, 10 kilodalton range, which is traditionally very difficult with a recombinant system or a transient system. So part of our deliverables for our cell-free platform is between 0.2 and 1 mg. So this is where the range usually falls. We've had some really good expressors that can go up to 5 mg and some that, that stay around that 200 microgram range because they are difficult targets. Um, with this package, it comes standard with SDS page and UVBIS. One thing I forgot to mention, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and I'll answer them right at the end of the talk. Um, so from here, I have several examples to share with you all. So this is a traditional expression in the cell-free. Um, so it's an SCFV HIS expression. It was completed in one to two weeks. Um, we launched about two mils of culture and we were able to get nice, pure um, purification. Some of them a little purer than others. I have greater than 75% because column two is a little not as pure. You can see some of those bands, um, about 66 kilodaltons. Um, but if you look at 
lane one or four, much higher purity. Um, and these, like I said before, from gene synthesis all the way to purification. Um, yep. Um, here I have a short peptide example. In this case, uh, we have a Hisumo and then the peptide at the end. Um, and we have three peptides on this screen of varying um, sequence. We were able to get about 200 micrograms of each of these peptides um, in about four weeks. And you can see here they have a little bit also varying of purity, but greater than 75% in lane two, I would argue is much higher than that um, with that nice clean band. So again, um, very fast, four weeks um, in comparison. Um, we would, our baclovirus or even, um, excuse me, our E. coli expressions would usually take about five to six weeks, including gene synthesis. So this is a very fast and it's very, very efficient um, to expressing these small peptides. Um, here, I have a little bit of a comparison. Um, so for some VHH and SCFEs, people prefer mammalian systems um, due to things like um, familiarity, um, closer to druggable systems, things like that. Um, so there are valid reasons for why you would want to choose a mammalian cell expression over a bacterial expression. But I for this type of platform, this is your first screen. This is which sequences express well, which sequences um, are we going to focus on to bring up to our next study. So mammalian cell culture can take two to three days. Um, they're grown under selection for a couple of days. This I actually don't even have the step where you grow up the cells before you transfect the DNA. Um, you do a media change, and then each culture is its own expression. And our cell-free system, like I said earlier, is a one one day expression. We are saving considerable time here in being able to express multiple constructs all at once. Um, so I do have a comparison because um, sometimes um, one of the things people will be worried about in expressing their constructs in a cell-free system versus a mammalian system is maintaining that um, affinity. Because if you're screening a lot of compounds and you're comparing affinities about which ones to move to the next step, it's hard to do that without the activity or the affinity. So um, on the right or left-hand side of your screen, I have an example of an anti-IL6R VHH. Um, and then we have it expressed in both mammalian and cell-free system. Um, we did an ELISA EC50 multiple concentrations to compare the EC50s in both systems. And you can see these lines are pretty much on top of each other. Both VHHs maintained activity and the cell-free is maintaining um, that bioactivity that you would wanna see when you're doing these high throughput screens. Um, on the right, I have another example. This is anti-trope 2 uh, VHH. Similar here, we are maintaining that bioactivity um, with both systems. So the affinity in this system is well-maintained, um, just even with the speed of how fast we're making these. So um, I have another example here. This, so very common, um, there are several drugs um, in preclinical, um, postclinical, um, phase one, phase two, and some that have passed that are VHH linker VHH. So they're bivalent VHH constructs. Um, and here in this example, I have six of them, um, and we were able to express them in our cell-free system with high purity. Um, so here we're seeing values over 92%, and these were completed in two weeks with a 500 microgram delivery. So 
in my previous examples, I've shown traditional VHH with one his tag, but we have done some examples in some cases with more complex structures where they have been very successful in this system. So here, just a quick example of one where it's a little bit more of a complicated structure. We have linkers, we have um, two VHH that are expressing simultaneously. These were actively um, expressed together and well with great purity very quickly. Okay. Um, so another thing about the cell-free system and any cell-free system really is it's a good alternative for um, difficult expression targets. So our system is validated for small fragment antibodies. So usually with small fragment antibodies, the issue is poor disulfide bond formation. Um, so we have an example on the screen where we have VHH with multiple disulfide bonds or one di disulfide bond with um, a glycine linker, either two or three, and then a terminal cysteine. And terminal cysteines are used for many different applications, but one of the most common is some kind of malamide conjugation, maybe to biotin, maybe to um, a fusion protein of some sort. So this is a very common um, construct that people like to express. However, because you're adding a cysteine to the end terminus, there are chances that there could be misformation of the disulfide bonds and or poor aggregation instability. So by using the cell-free system and removing a lot of the non-important things for recombinant expression from those uh, from the cell culture, we are able to prevent um, a lot of side reactions that are happening when we express things naturally and really narrowing that down to only what you really need for this recombinant expression. Um, so in this case, we were able to express these um, consistently. There we did have to do some buffer optimization to prevent a lot of the aggregation, but um, going from a system where these were not expressible at all in E. coli, uh, traditional E. coli expression, and we're able to express them in our cell-free system is really a nice improvement over that. Um, Okay, a little bit about our service um, packaging prices. So it is a high throughput system. We can do uh, up to 100 plus constructs um, at a time. We do have the throughput for that. Our pricing varies based on the number of constructs. That's pretty common. <laughs> the more uh, bulk pricing is uh, something that's very common to do. Um, the other thing we can do is couple these with affinity analysis. Um, like I described earlier, this is very important for doing that small scale screening, getting that affinity ranking so you know which molecules to move on with. Um, so I do have the next couple of slides where we've included pricing for things like ELISA's to do a quick ELISA screen to see if your maybe your antibody of interest binds the small protein or vice versa. Your target protein is binding these VHH or SCFVs. Um, okay, uh, like I said, we have two different options. If you want just quick tests, we have a two-point ELISA, um, or we can do, um, like my example I shared earlier, a whole EC50 curve to get that um, full EC50 measurement. Um, so we have options for either or and hundreds of antibodies at once. In addition to ELISA, we do have BLI um, using a HISTAG sensor with our um, the HISTAG that's already on them from the purification. Um, this technique will probably increase your timeline by one or two weeks, um, but is really worth it if you want that full gradient BLI or a more three-dimensional binding analysis. Um, because we can do a single point BLI or a full gradient similar to the ELISA. Okay. 
Um, so I'd like to wrap up uh, with some key takeaway points for self-free expression. Um, we are currently sticking to small volume expression for quick screening. This has been very successful in our case studies and for um, optimizing the disulfide formation. Um, we have significantly reduced the timeline over traditional mammalian expression as well as um, even bacterial expression is faster. And sometimes like the most difficult cases, it's more successful, which is also um, just great, especially for those really difficult targets, um, which I just said that in the second point. Um, oh yeah, one of the things I did forget to mention, we, um, I did say it is from gene synthesis all the way through. We don't need um, you to provide any kind of vectors. You just need to provide us with your sequences. Um, and we can check them really quick to make sure they kind of fit that VHH structure before we start as well. Um, and this is really something to use for those quick, high throughput screening, um, way to narrow down your big pool of constructs you have from, you know, IA modeling, computational design, maybe a antibody development campaign, um, a quick and easy way to really work through um, what's available and what what to really move on with and really focus your money and tension on. Um, all right. With that, I'd love to take any questions that popped up during the talk. Um, and thank you for listening. OK, I think I'll need to switch screens so that I can see the chat. Uh, OK. Um, so for the question, how many reactions can you run in parallel? What volume? Um, so we've run up to about 300 at once. Um, and usually the two mils to five mil range. So two more questions. What types of proteins are most suitable for production using cell-free expression systems? So we right now have validated small proteins um, and small um, antibody fragments. So I would recommend anything with a lot of cysteines, honestly, because we've validated the system for VHH expression. It means and the small molecule antibodies, they're heavily dependent on disulfide bond formation. So if you have a protein with a lot of cysteines or disulfides in general that are important for its structure, I think this is a really good system for you to try. And we're working on getting up a little bit higher in molecular weight. We have had a successful case of a protein that was around 30 kilodaltons. Um, so if you have maybe a little bit bigger and you've been having trouble expressing it in E. coli, I think it's really worth reaching out to us to see if we can get it in the cell-free system. Um, and this, another question, how do cell-free expression systems handle post-translational modifications? This is actually an excellent question. So they don't. So mammalian systems will be better for post-translational modifications. Our system does not use any kind of additional reagents that promote things like glycosylation and stuff like that. If you need glycosylation, I would heavily recommend our mammalian cell VHH production. Um, again, this system is designed to do the quick checks. And once you've got your best 10, then I would move on to the mammalian system and look at those post-translational modifications and things like that. Uh, let's see. Um, another question from Charles. Is it possible to directly purchase your cell-free system to use in our lab? So 
this has not been released yet. Um, we are still in the R&D stage of creating a cell-free uh, kit. Um, so hopefully soon we'll have that up and running and available, but it's not available yet. It's in the works. Um, I have another question here. Can we use PCR Fragment as a template? Yes. Um, we do prefer that you, we make the PCR fragments ourselves um, due to shipping and that kinds of thing, those kinds of things. It is easier for us to get a better read if we produce it in our ourselves. But we can use PCR fragments as a template. The only risk with that is we don't sequence the plasmids. Um, before, obviously, you would throw the PCR fragment right in, right? So there is a risk that you're not getting the exact sequence that you're looking for. Um, can uh, So another question is, can you deliver 0.2 to 1 mg of protein of interest in a small volume suitable for high throughput? Yes. So this we are readily getting on an average actually closer to five micrograms of protein regularly um, in small volumes. And then this is great for some high throughput screening, maybe um, BLI, SPR, those kinds of things. Um, but yes, this is very compatible with a high throughput system um, and binding affinity. Uh, another question. What do you think could be making large proteins less suitable for your cell free system? So I don't know if it is necessarily that it won't work for a large protein. Um, we've validated it specifically for the smaller proteins. So we, long story short, we don't want to guarantee that it's going to work um, because we have... Uh, yet to validate our system for this. Um, we've really focused on hitting these high throughput targets and these small proteins that are fit in that really you know, unique place in between um, the uh, solid state synthesis and the traditional recombinant expression. Um, there are I know there are a couple other cell-free systems that actually directly target things like membrane proteins um, as well. So I know that our system kind of fits in the market in that nice niche where um, other, other companies have gone in different directions. Um, so another question. Can you use different tags in addition to the HIST tag? Um, yes, yeah, we'd be open to adding additional tags. Um, we haven't, the HIST tag is very uh, much our standard for the pur uh, purification and it's the best way to get that. Um, so we use like a pressurized system to pu purify them all at once which is really set up for his tag right now. But if you need like a flag tag for your assay or something like that, that is definitely easy to add on there. So uh, one last question, it looks like here, is it possible that some of the proteins um, Sorry, I'm going to butcher that word a little bit. Having some, the same size on the gel could have errors in the sequence. So for our cell-free system, we sequence the plasmids before we use them. So we, unless you use a PCR fragment, um, we would check the sequence before um, we do the expression. Um, like you would a traditional expression. We check the, you check the vectors before you do the expression. The only caveat to that is the PCR fragment. So if you use the PCR fragments, we don't check before we do the expression. Um, okay, check here. So uh, follow up to the question I just answered. Um, 
if the wrong amino acids were incorporated into the protein. Oh, I see what you're saying. So I think there's the same chance of this happening with a traditional expression as a self-free uh, expression. Um, the way the way you check really is to have a protein sequenced. Um, and there are a couple companies who do that. Um, but because we're actually extracting the lysates, we're not using, you know, a recombinant polymerase. We're using the natural polymerase. So there's the same chance of the wrong amino acids being incorporated as it would be in a E. coli system. Um, another question, can we provide the plasmid for expression? Um, so actually this is a very popular question. I'm glad you asked. So we have a proprietary vector that we use for our system um, that we have validated for the expression system. Um, I actually, now that I say this, don't know how they're going to get around that in the cell-free kit. Um, I will let you know when we <laughs> release the cell-free kit. But for right now, it's honestly in the time it would take for our U.S. customers to ship the plasmids to China for the production. Um, we would have made and um, subcloned the vector into the one we were going to use for expression anyway. So it's not really as much of a time saver. Um, and the other option is if you already got it in a plasmid, you don't want to pay for gene synthesis again, we could subclone it for you into our own. And we would just need enough to do a quick E. coli replication. Um, you know, just enough to smear on a, um, a Petri dish. Um. So why do we use DNTPs? So the DNTPs are fed into the polymerase reaction to um, incorporate the um, amino acids as you do the recombinant, um, sorry, as you do the protein translation. So it kind of works the same way a PCR reaction or Plymouth chain reaction works. Um, so you're using, um, you know, AT, uh, ATP, NTP, um, those um, to add the components of DNA when you're replicating the DNA into mRNA um, to do the protein translation. So they're, P they're um, how you incorporate um, the new sequence as you're translating. Um, it's part of the how the um, central dogma works, those kinds of things. I hope that answers your question. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to Sino or me. Um, we'd be happy to answer anything that comes in as things pop up. Um, I am glad you guys took a little bit of your time today to come listen to me talk about recombinant expression um, in, in our cell-free system. Um, it was great to meet all of you, and please feel free to reach out to us and let us know um, if you need some help with any of your recombinant expressions. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.